Hi guys, long time no see. Um, I'm back here again to talk about performance. Um, so we'll we'll get into that shortly here. Um, just want to give a disclaimer. Don't mind if I take a few breaks here and there. Um, got done cutting the lawn and I'm really thirsty, so I'm going to be demolishing a lemonade occasionally. Okay. Um, but anyway, what is performance? Right. We just kind of take that term at face value a lot of times, right? But we don't really like stop and think about what it means, right? So performance is how well something does something that we want it to do, right? So if we're talking about an airplane, we might consider performance in terms of a climb rate. Um, we might want a good rate of climb to uh, be available, right? So that we can gain sufficient altitude in a timely manner in case an emergency happens. So we don't want an airplane that doesn't have enough power to climb, right, at a sufficient rate. Um, or we might want an airplane that's really fast, right, that has great cruise performance in terms of speed if we can move across the ground really fast, okay? I want to just make sure I'm still recording this. Yeah, okay. Um, but anyway, we look for different things, right, if we have different objectives, okay? Um, but all in all, right, we want good performance across the board, right? So in order to accurately gauge how well an aircraft can perform a certain task, we have to take a lot of factors into consideration, right? Um, so in this video here, we watched it in class, um, but if you literally type this into YouTube, um, if you weren't in class, you can see it. And essentially what happens in this video is we have um, a plane load of pilots, there are four of them, because um, it's a four-seater, so it's a full plane. They are taking off from a gravel strip or a dirt strip um, at an airport that's, I think, above 6,000 feet above sea level. And it's it's sunny, so I can only imagine that it's probably fairly warm out. Um, it's probably not winter time out. There's no snow or anything, so temperature's probably high. And um, they apply full power, and they're going down the runway and everything and the aircraft isn't really leaving the ground. Um, eventually they run out of space on that strip and now they're just kind of in the grass and eventually they do leave the ground, but I don't think their altitude ever gets higher than 100, 150 AGL. And they're just kind of hovering there, losing altitude. And um, at the beginning it's okay because there are no obstructions or anything um, but as the video goes on you can see that there are um, trees there's a forest ahead and um, that's where that airplane ends up i believe everybody survived that they're just some kind of gruesome injuries right and, and i'm sure the airplane was written off um, but it just goes to show some of those factors in effect and what can what can happen right when we don't take those factors seriously okay so as I said, right, performance is how well the aircraft does a, a certain task, right? Um, and whatever our aim is at the end of the day is important when it comes to performance, right? Whatever we are looking for is what we would prioritize. Um, if you have money to buy an aircraft and you need it for a particular utility purchase, um, that is something that you would consider a lot more than somebody who's probably just like buying an aircraft just to fly, right? Um, Airlines, right, the big thing these days is not really cruise speed. Every aircraft pretty much reaches close to Mach 1, I think like Mach 0 0.7, 0 0.8, somewhere up there. Um, but the major concern is fuel economy, right? So if, if you're an airline and you're going out to purchase a new, um, you know, part of your fleet, then that's something that would be important to you, right, is an aircraft that offers great fuel efficient, efficiency, okay? So um, all of these factors and everything that we've kind of talked about, well, well, we'll get into those, but everything I've sort of mentioned from that video um, is not the same every day, right? Um, even in the same location, things might be different. For instance, if that particular video might have happened during the winter wintertime, um, even though they were at the 6,000 feet, they might have had a little bit of a better climb out, right? And they probably would have had some better performance. Okay, so that's, I guess, kind of the fun thing about being a pilot is that, you know, there's no day that's quite the same. Um, yes, you might be flying the same aircraft for the millionth time, 
Um, yes, you might be going to the same destination or hanging out around the same training airport, but the conditions are always different, and that's what makes it fun, okay? If you handle those changes appropriately, right? If you neglect those and you just kind of take the day at face value, then things might not go quite right, okay? So take all that stuff into account. So I'm saying that everything changes day to day, right? If we need, if, or if, if we're going to understand what this change is, right, or what this change looks like, then we have to kind of have that basis, right? So remember the standard atmosphere is something that was created to kind of give us that guideline, okay? So um, all of the aspects of the standard atmosphere is basically an average of year-round worldwide weather, okay? So remember we've got the 15 degrees Celsius at sea level, okay? We've got the standard pressure of 2992, so 29.92 inches of mercury. We're supposed to lose one inch of pressure, one inch of mercury per thousand, right? Feet that we climb or ascend. And we're also supposed to lose two degrees Celsius per thousand feet climb. So um, if we just kind of go back in our flight training memories, um, there were hardly any days where these conditions um, existed for us in any aspect, right? You might have an occasional day here and there where the uh, altimeter setting is 299 or 2. Um, I think there's one not that long ago, but that's kind of a, a hit or miss thing, right? And we certainly don't have the 15 degrees, right? I mean, I guess number one, because we're not at sea level. Um, so I guess for us, 400 MSL, 400 above, is going to put us close to 14, is what our standard temperature is supposed to be. But, you know, we've got seasons and everything that happen, and uh, very wishy-washy weather, right? We had some hot weather last week, and now it's cooled down to kind of the mid-60s um, as a high, okay? So we, we're kind of bouncing all over the place, um, but that's neither here or there on a seasonal scale, right? And... Um, yeah, these other things hardly happen, right? We could probably pull up some winds and temps aloft right now, and we wouldn't probably see the two degrees per thousand, right? That's not what happens most days. So if these things aren't happening most days, then, like I said, we have to consider those, those changes, right? How will all of these changes that are outside of the standards that were established, how will they affect our performance? So probably the big one is density altitude. And we'll talk about what that is in a little bit, but that adjusts for non-standard pressure and non-standard temperature, okay? Um, weight is another big thing, right? Remember I said there were four people in that aircraft um, from the video before. It was just a single engine Stenson, and um, that makes a huge difference, right? Um, at SIU, when we have things like United Day or American Day, and um, some of us instructors volunteer to fly the per, uh, prospective students around. Well, we have three students in the airplane with us, and we make sure to operate um, at less than half, half tanks, okay? Because we want to make sure that we are within the weight and balance limits prescribed for the aircraft. Um, even then, we understand that the behavior of the aircraft and the handling characteristics are going to be a little bit different when we've got a lot of weight. Um, especially if we're doing it when it's warm out, right? We know our climb performance won't be as good as it would be if it was just two of us and it was colder out. So we use things like short field takeoff techniques to make sure that, you know, we can climb out and clear obstacles and things like that. Um, so weight is a huge thing, right? Surface condition. Um, what I mean by this is, is the runway surface paved? Are you on grass? Are you on gravel or dirt? Um, those things that are not so smooth, um, like the paved surface, provide a little bit more resistance and friction, right? So it takes a little bit more time to speed up to an appropriate uh, rotation speed, and that's going to lengthen that takeoff uh, roll, right? And then wind. Um, is the wind helping or hurting us? The more of a headwind component we have, the better it is for us, right? Um, we try to take off with as much of a headwind component as possible day in and day out. So if we've got a wind, I don't know, out of the south, right, we're, of course, going to use the one eights, right, because that gives us the most headwind. Um, the headwind is beneficial for two main reasons, right, the first of which being if we have a wind traveling the opposite direction than us, um, that promotes airspeed increase, 
right? So that happens faster. We gain the airspeed faster, and once we have sufficient airspeed, then the wings can create sufficient lift, and we can leave the ground. The other thing is if we have a wind against us, then that decreases our, our ground speed and everything, right? So we will um, take up less space leaving the, the ground, climbing up, okay? The last thing, configuration refers to flaps and gear if you've got a complex airplane, right? So are we using 10 degrees um, per the short field takeoff technique? Do we have no flaps? That sort of stuff, okay? So all of these things play a, a part into um, our performance on a given day. So density altitude, as I said, corrects for non-standard pressure and temperature. So again, most days we find ourselves at a altimeter setting other than 29 or 92, temperature other than 15 degrees you know, Celsius at the sea level, whatever it is adjusted for your fuel elevation. So we have to kind of take those things into account. Now, um, for your flight training, right, most days we don't really make those calculations because we have long runways, right? Um, there are only two of us in there. And, um, you know, we have certainty that we have enough room to leave the ground, right? So we don't really calculate this day in and day out and everything, but it's a good thing to kind of get into the swing of, of doing. Um, I personally don't calculate it outright every single day, but just kind of seeing what the altimeter setting is um, kind of gives me some idea of, you know, how the performance might turn out to be, okay? Um, so when we say pressure altitude, right, when we adjust for non-standard pressure, this is essentially how the airplane feels like it's performing, okay? So um, I guess in terms of altitude, right? So we know the higher up we go, the less dense the air is, right? So the, the worse the performance is. So if we have a pressure altitude that is less than standard, right, then there's not as much air in a given parcel or space, right? So if there aren't that many air molecules, then all of the airfoils on the, on the airplane, right, don't move as much air back or, you know, interact with air in the same way. Um, so lift can't be created as efficiently, okay? And I say airfoils because, remember, we've got the wings and we've also got the propeller, right, that is technically an airfoil. So if those surfaces can't really interact with as much air as they need to to, you know, perform better, then you're not going to have great performance, okay? So um, the way that we go about calculating the pressure altitude is quite simple, right? So we take that standard pressure setting of 29.92, and whatever the reported pressure is, we always subtract, okay? It does not matter if it's greater than uh, 29.92, we always subtract. So in this instance, you can see it is greater, right? The reported value was 29.97. So we will get a negative value, okay? And sign does matter, okay? Sometimes we um, take away some, I guess, some elevation to make this adjustment for non-standard pressure, and sometimes we add it, okay? So the sign always matters, okay? So if we take 29.92 and subtract 29.97 from that, we get negative 0 0.05, okay? Now, remember the rules of a standard atmosphere, right? We are supposed to lose one inch of pressure, one inch of mercury for every thousand feet of altitude gain, okay? So in order to figure out what that adjustment actually is over those thousand feet, we need to multiply whatever we got from that subtraction problem above by 1,000. Okay, so if, you, if we multiply that negative 0 0.05 by 1,000, that becomes a negative 50-foot adjustment, okay? So what this means is if we add this to whatever our starting altitude is, so our field elevation, it could be a cruise altitude, um, your, even your current altitude if you're flying, right, and you're climbing, okay? Whatever that, that starting altitude is, add the adjustment, and that gives you your pressure altitude, right? So um, our field elevation at Southern Illinois Airport is 411 feet. If we add the negative 50, which is the same as subtracting 50, we get 361 feet 
above um, mean sea level for the pressure altitude. Okay, so that's the math there, right? Um, let's say that our reported um, altimeter setting was actually 2987. If we again subtract that from the standard, then this time that would give us a positive 0 0.05, right? And again, we would multiply it by the thousand because we need to know how much this adjustment should be over that thousand feet, okay? So it would be positive 50 this time, and we would add that to the 411, and that would become 461 for the pressure altitude. Okay, so for, for pressure altitude, remember you want a lower value uh, because that indicates better performance, okay? Um, if it's higher than your field elevation or your cruise altitude or whatever altitude you are um, correcting the non-standard pressure for, your performance will be worse, right? Um, so a 50-foot difference probably isn't that much, Right, but if we were to have a pretty high pressure setting like three zero five four or something like that, then you could see how that adjustment would be a lot greater. Right, if it was three, I'm just doing some mental math. If it's three zero five four, then that's let's see, negative, um, I think point six two. Yeah, point six two. So if we multiply that by one thousand. That is an adjustment factor of negative 620 feet. Okay, and then if we again add that negative value to the 411, for us that would actually make our pressure altitude be less than um, sea level, right? Which is some some great performance. Okay, so it's good to have that lower value, and yes, depending on how far you are from sea level, that value can become negative. Okay. So non-standard pressure and then temperature, right? Um, we have to also adjust for that. So if we aren't really getting the um, you know standard temperature that we're expecting, then we need to make up for that, right? So there are performance charts that are included in POHs for pretty much every aircraft. Um, and they're usually in increments of 10, I've seen um, 20, so they'll have maybe a standard temperature in the middle, and then 20 below and 20 above. And what we have to do as pilots is we have to kind of figure out um, how to figure out where we fall between that, right, by using interpolation, okay? Sometimes it works out, so it's like 20 above standard or whatever, um, and you could just use that, that column and take those numbers directly from it. But most of the time, if we want a precise number, we have to go between those, those columns, okay? So um, if the temperature is quite high, right, then our performance is not going to be that great. I'm sure most of you are experiencing this firsthand um, because when we started in this class, right, it was pretty cold out. Um, we had that one weird day in, um, I can't remember if it was like late January or February, but we had that weird day where it was exceptionally warm. But outside of that, right, it, it was pretty cold, okay? But now it's warmed up to mid-60s right now. Um, and last week it was, it was in the 80s, right? So um, we kind of experienced that firsthand, right? We have a little bit of a longer takeoff roll. Our climb out is not as, as great, right? Um, so that's what happens when temperature is not within standards. Um, unfortunately, there's no real shorthand way like we figured out for the pressure altitude um, to kind of, you know, lump this in to get a density altitude without using those charts in the POH. And then humidity is the last factor for this. Um, there are no charts for humidity. Um, we just have to kind of remember that as, as pilots, right? If the um, moisture content in the air is quite high, then that decreases the air density further. So our performance is not going to be as good, right? And we know that when the temperature is higher, the air has an easier time hanging on to that moisture, right? So, you know, if you're flying in Florida in the summertime, um, there's a good chance you're going to have some pretty bad performance um, for all of the above reasons. Your pressure setting might not be that bad, 
but you're going to have high temps um, and you're going to have high humidity, right? Whereas if you've got, you know, um, if you're in like a like a northern region, right, like maybe one of the Dakotas, I have South Dakota for some odd reason. I've never been there, but I figured it was just kind of a good arbitrary example. But if you're up there, right, um, then it might not be as warm. And if it's not as warm, then there's probably not going to be as much moisture in the air. Right. So the performance would probably be slightly better. Um, so, yeah. OK. OK, so um, if we had, let's say, low reported pressure, so something below standard, we had um, high temps, right, and high humidity, all of those things together are going to give us the worst performance, OK? Um, you might, again, have something that just doesn't quite fit the mold there sometimes. So the probably the most common thing is you won't have a low pressure setting. You might have a high or close to standard pressure setting. But these other variables are, I think, worse than having, you know, maybe a low pressure, reported pressure. Um, so if you've got those high temps and high relative humidity, you will also have bad performance. Okay, And then just the opposite for good, right? You have high reported pressure, you have low temperatures, you have low relative humidity, you will have better performance. Okay, So that's kind of the gist of that. Okay. All right, moving on, we're going to talk about um, the performance charts and information in the POH. Okay, um, I think I asked this in class and like nobody raised their hand, but uh, when I was a student pilot, I learned about Glenn P. Wass. It's not a real person or anything, but the POH is arranged um, so that this uh, this name works to you know help you remember the section so you have general limitations emergencies normal procedures you have performance weight and balance aircraft systems handling and like supplemental information um, so the p is what we want right the performance section is section five of, of your poh and we're going to look at the charts for wind components so figuring out how much of the wind is a headwind or tailwind or crosswind all that jazz and um, takeoff distances, so how long is it going to take us to leave the ground, or how many feet is it going to take us? Uh, if we have to clear an obstacle, how many feet will that take us to you know, climb above that, that obstacle? We've got climb chart. Um, we, we're not going to look at that. Or just kidding. We are going to look at that today. And then uh, cruise chart, right? And then landing distances is pretty much the same as the takeoff distances chart. The values are just different, OK? Uh, healthy swig eliminate right there. Okay, so let's look at the wind component chart. This chart I like a lot. It's kind of fun to use. Um, confusing at the beginning, but I promise it gets better. All right, so if we look at this wind component chart and we look at all the markings, right, we notice a few different things. There are these arcs here that run like this that show the overall wind velocity. So this is the velocity of the reported wind. We have not broken it down into a headwind or tailwind or crosswind component at all, right? That's just the pure wind velocity. The axes here show the different components, right? So the one along the left, or I guess the what we would call the Y axis, is um, headwind tailwind component, right? So you can see here at 90 degrees, that's where the zero is. And that makes sense, right? If we have a wind that's you know 90 degrees from us, right? Then we wouldn't have a headwind or tailwind component, right? That would just be a pure crosswind. So that makes sense. And then um, on the x-axis, we've got crosswind component, okay? The next thing we've got is um, the angle between wind direction and runway. So that's what all these lines are here, okay, that run this way. So you can see we got all the way from 10 to um, <laughs> pretty much 170 degrees, um, but hopefully <laughs> we don't have to have to use all that, right? So this angle, right, we determine um, by choosing the runway that's best suited for the wind, and then of course taking that wind direction and then finding that, that angle between the two, right? <clears throat> 
So at um, Southern Illinois Airport, if the wind is coming out of 200, which is like the south-southwest, we would plan on using our um, south-facing runways, right? So our 1 8 um, And that would give us the most headwind component, right? Because that's the goal at the end of the day. The more headwind do we have, the shorter our takeoff roll is going to be, right? And the better our climb out performance is going to be. So we would use the 1 8 If I subtract um, 1 8 0 from 200, let's see if I can make a minus sign here. That gives me a difference of 20 degrees, right? So on this chart, I know right away, based on this wind information here, that I would want to follow this 20 degree line down. And remember, these arcs here show us the pure wind velocity, right, of the reported wind, OK? So I see an arc here that um, shows 30 knots. I don't want that. That's too much. I don't want 25 knots. I don't even want 20, right? I don't want 15. Okay, so I'm just following this 20 degree line down. And I'm finding about where we've got 13-ish knots, right? So there's a little bit of guesstimation here. I'm saying it's probably about right here-ish, OK? So from this point, I've, again, found right on the 20 degrees between the wind direction and runway um, on the 13 um, knot arc, right? I found my place there where those meet. What I'm going to do at this point is draw a line straight across best I can and a line straight down. Okay, you guys pray for me. This is probably going to be a janky line. Wow, that was not Okay, so the information I just figured out is, number one, do we have a tailwind or headwind component, right? We probably already answered that because we chose the runway to make sure we had that headwind component. Um, so we do have a headwind component, and if we follow our marking straight to the left, follow that line, that beautiful line I made that I'll probably never make again, we can see that that puts us around 12 knots of headwind, right? So about 12. OK, and then if we follow the line down to the crosswind axis, um, then that puts us at about four knots of crosswind, I think. Let's see here. Yeah, probably closer to five, right? Maybe four and a half. OK, but it's about four ish. OK, so not that much of a crosswind component. It's mostly a headwind. OK. Um, now, there are questions that you will find on the written test where they want you to work backwards. For instance, they might give you a um, crosswind component, and they want you to figure out um, maybe what the overall velocity of the wind is. So, for instance, they might say something like, um, if you have a 15, no, let's not make 15, let's make it 10. If you have a 10 knot crosswind, right? And there's a 30 degree angle between um, your wind direction and runway. They probably won't tell you it's 30 degrees. They'll probably tell you the wind is coming out of 110 and your runway is, um, you know, um, runway 8. Right. They, they might phrase it that way. Um, then you would need to figure out that that overall velocity, right, by working backwards. So in this case, if I know it's 10, right, for my crosswind component, and I know there are 30 degrees between my wind direction and runway, then I would just start down here at my crosswind component area here, um, axis, and then follow this line up. Oops, this one is not straight. And then I would follow it to where I hit my 30 degree angle, OK? So that was not that great, but you can see, right, that that would put us right on the 20 knot mark, right? So we would have a 20 knot wind from a, I guess, a direction and uh, 30 degrees away from our runway direction, okay? So they might ask you to work backwards. Um, just do the reverse of what we did to figure out the headwind and crosswind components. OK, let's continue. So 
This right here is a takeoff distance chart for the 172R model. Um, love the steam gauge Rs. Um, but there are a number of things here to consider, right? Um, first is the title, right? Short field takeoff distance at 2450 pounds, okay? So this implies that you are following the short field takeoff technique, okay? In order to yield these results, you must do that. And 2,450 pounds, we're not always going to be at the max takeoff weight, right? This chart is just set up in a way to give us the performance outcome for a fully loaded airplane, okay? So if we are less than that, right, if our weight is less than the maximum takeoff, then we can expect to leave the ground a little sooner than these values here, right? So these are basically worst case scenario values. Okay, so in that sense, in the sense of weight, right, this chart is kind of an estimation. It's an overestimation, right, um, of the required runway distance. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, there's not a chart for different weights for this particular airplane. You might have that in maybe some larger aircraft because the performance differences are quite drastic. Um, but for us, this will this will do, right? So we've got that. We've got the conditions. So um, you need 10 degrees of flaps, right? That's part of that short field takeoff technique. Full throttle prior to brake release, again, part of the short field. And then these conditions, right, have you on a paved level dry runway. So if it just rained and the runway is a little wet, right, you can probably expect these um, figures to be a little bit shorter than what you might actually end up achieving, right? Again, I don't, I don't know how much um, variance there is, you know, if you're 200, 300 pounds below the 2450. Um, but again, right, the, the wet runway is not really part of those conditions, so that's going to have a negative outcome. Okay, so that's going to affect these performance figures negatively. Um, level, um, it's hard to find a completely level runway. There might be a little, little tiny bit of slope um, pretty much anywhere. Sometimes it's more pronounced. Um, if you go on the cross country to Dyersburg, you will see that um, I believe runway 20 is what they have. That slopes downward quite a bit. Um, so that's, that's something to kind of be mindful of. Zero wind. Um, there are not many days, especially as of late, where we've had zero wind, right? So that's going to be a factor. Um, Liftoff speed, right? We are prompt at leaving the ground at 51 knots, right? And our speed at 50 feet above the ground is going to be 57 knots. So these are all conditions that they um, apply to their testing to get these figures, okay? Um, so outside of that, we've got the actual chart in and of itself. And these charts basically um, account for density altitude, right? So on the left, we've got the column for pressure altitude. And you can see we've got everything from sea level, which is zero MSL, all the way up to 8,000 MSL, okay? We've also got um, a row for temperature. So we've got um, zero degrees Celsius all the way up to 40 degrees Celsius. Um, what happens when we have temperatures below freezing? Well, our performance is probably going to be even better than what's listed here, right? Um, for instance, if we were at sea level and we were just concerned about our ground roll, um, we would probably do better than 845 if the temperature was like negative 10, right? Um, and then if it were above 40, um, I probably wouldn't fly, but we would expect that performance to be a lot worse, right? If it was super warm out Okay, and then you've got the option for all of these temperatures to either just calculate ground roll or a 50 foot obstacle clearance as well. Okay, so sometimes that might be important. You might have trees at the end of the runway that you're trying to climb over in a timely manner. There might be um, other obstructions, right, or things like that um, that you would need to clear. So they have that option there for your convenience. And then notes at the bottom, right? Um, number one just says do the short field te uh, technique, right? If you don't do that, then you're not going to get the performance results that you were expecting to get from this chart. Um, two is if you're above 3,000 feet elevation, right? Make sure that you lean the mixture to give you maximum RPMs and a full throttle static run up. Um, and then three is about winds, right? If we have a headwind, 
um, then we need to decrease distances 10% for each nine knots. If we have a tailwind, right, which we're trying to not have, then we would need to increase the distances um, by 10% for each two knots, right? And that just says up to 10 knots. So hopefully we don't have any tailwind, we just have headwind. Um, and then four is about dry grass runway, right? Then we would increase our distances because the grass has a little bit more friction, right? It's not as, as hard and smooth as a paved surface. So it's going to take us a little bit more to leave the ground. And then um, where there is not a value, so you can see under the 40 degrees Celsius column um, at 8,000, there really just isn't um, performance that's good enough to um, warrant them putting a value there. So I would say if you find yourself in that condition, um, wait for cooler temps, right? Um, if you can't, I guess, descend, right? Um, because you're you're stationed at, a, at an airport with a high field elevation, just wait for it to cool down. <laughs> that's all you can really do there. Um, Okay, so though that's how the chart is made up. So if we look at the chart, right, and we try to figure out what our performance values are going to look like, we have two different ways of doing that, right? So I've included some sample information um, to kind of give us a starting place. So our temperature in this example is going to be 7 degrees Celsius, so it's not that warm. But the 15 degrees Celsius is like 59 Fahrenheit. 0 is 32, so that's somewhere between the 2, so 27, divide that roughly in half, that's like um, like 45 degrees, right, something like that. So it's not that warm, and the altimeter setting is uh, 30.33, and the wind is the same as the previous, previous example, right, so 200 at 13 knots. So we will assume also that we are here at KMDH. So we will probably, in this example, plan to use the 1.8s like we did before. So there are two main ways to figure out expected performance, right? The first of which is a um, kind of a rough method, right, um, called rounding. So what we do in this method is we just kind of um, figure out what kind of the overall performance is going to look like. We don't go into exact figures. We're just underestimating the performance figures, right? Um, so we're planning for worse performance. So for instance, if we had a temperature of seven degrees, that would be between this zero degree column, right, and 10 degree column. Um, which of these has worse performance? Well, you can see that the 10 degree column as expected, right, has longer ground roll distances and longer um, 50 foot clearance um, distances, right? So that's the column I would go with if I was rounding. And let's say my pressure altitude put me somewhere between sea level and 1,000. What I would do is I would look to see again which one has worse performance. If we have higher pressure altitude, right, the aircraft is not going to perform as well. And that's evident by the numbers. So I would just choose the 10 degrees Celsius and 1,000 foot pressure altitude area, right, where they meet. So if I was planning for ground roll, dif uh, ground roll distance, then 1,000 would be my go-to. And my 50-foot clearance, um, obstacle clearance distance would be 1,790. Okay, And this is done when we don't have a ton of time to plan. If we're trying to make a quick turnaround, um, it is a perfectly sound way to plan because if you've got enough distance um, to account for kind of that over, or I guess really underestimation on, per on performance, um, I don't know what the better term is there, but anyway, if we've got enough distance for that, then that's kind of a better safe than sorry approach to take. So we're planning, we're probably going to have less than a thousand feet taken up if we're just doing ground roll, right? But we're planning for a thousand, so we will make sure that we have enough runway for that. Um, you know, so that's kind of that approach, right? That's the easy way, but for check ride purposes and um, cross country planning, right? What's going to be expected of you is interpolation. And interpolation is where we get down to the real nitty gritty, right? We're trying to figure out um, a pretty exact performance figure. There is a little bit of rounding at the end, that's fine. Um, but we're trying to figure out a pretty solid number. 
right? And if you're planning cross country or about to go on check ride, then you should have a lot of time to plan, right? So, um, oh, we already kind of answered that question there, right? And then the last thing to never forget, right, is note application. So most days you will have wind, right? Make sure you're using the short field takeoff technique if you want these actual numbers. Most times we calculate these numbers when we don't actually do the short field takeoff technique. So, you know, we will, of course, have a longer ground roll than that. But if we're in sort of a real world application kind of scenario, um, where we didn't have that long of a runway um, and we you know didn't have a ton of margin for error like we have every day at um, Carbondale then we would probably be a little bit more stringent on that right we would go ahead and use that actual technique right? but don't forget to account um, wind right direction strength all that how much headwind you have um, into the calculation okay so for interpolation, the way we generally set this up is what I like to call the, not the tac-tac-toe, the tic-tac-toe, I can't type, I guess, um, but the tic-tac-toe method, right? So we basically make a grid. Um, hopefully this turns out okay. Okay. And we're taking all those pieces of information and um, plugging them in, right? So the example before we set our temperature was seven degrees. So that puts us between zero and 10 degrees. So we're gonna put that on the outers. And then this middle column here, seven degrees. And then for our rows, um, we, why don't we go ahead and calculate Hopefully my drawing will stay. Yes, it does. Okay. Um, hopefully, or let's let's go ahead and calculate um, the pressure altitude here, right? So if we take, let me grab my phone calculator out. If we take our altimeter setting, right, and subtract that from the standard, so two nine or nine or two minus the three zero point three three we get a value of negative 0.41. Now, what do we do with this? We multiply it by 1,000, right, to figure out how big that adjustment actually is over those 1,000 feet, okay? So that becomes a value of negative 10, and in our case, our field elevation is 411, so we would go ahead and add 411 to that, and that gives us a pressure altitude of 1. So I'm thinking maybe if I ever present this again, I will change my example altimeter setting. Okay, so that gives us a pressure altitude of one. So that goes in the middle there. We have sea level here. And honestly, if I wasn't showing you guys an example, I would go ahead and um, stick with the sea level value because when we get done, you'll see that the difference between sea level as a pressure altitude and one foot MSL as a pressure altitude is pretty negligible. Okay. So with this tic-tac-toe or tac-tac-toe as I typed it um, chart set up, we can now start to plug in the given values. Okay. So let's do ground roll. Okay. So if we take the sea level zero degree ground roll figure here. That's going to be 845. Sorry that my writing is really bad. I promise my actual handwriting is so much better. Okay, so 845. And then if we go across here and we grab the sea level 10 degree value, that is 910. Okay. If we grab the zero degree 1,000 foot value, it's 925, so that goes down here in its respective place. Boom. And then the 10 degree 1,000, um, yeah, 1,000 foot value is 1,000. So that's kind of cool and convenient. Man, zeros have never been harder to write. Okay, so we've got two ways of figuring out what value goes in the middle here, right? Because that's what we're trying to figure out at the end of the day. 
we want to interpolate for a temperature of 7 degrees. We want to interpolate for a uh, pressure altitude of 1 foot. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so let's start with something I like to start with um, is the temperature because the interpolation is a little bit more friendly um, for explanation. Okay, so when we are interpolating, we have to take two differences into account. We need to take the difference in these values here into account between these two different temperatures and then also the difference between the temperatures themselves. Because what we are trying to essentially figure out for this example is how many feet of change there are per degree, right? We need to know how many feet to alter these values by to reflect a temperature of seven degrees, right? We know what the value is for 10 degrees and we know what the value is for zero degrees, but that's how we figure out what's in between, okay? So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to find the difference between those values there. So let's start with the sea level values and um, we'll subtract those, okay? So 9, 10, I'm not going to write it out because it's going to be really messy, but 9, 10 minus 845 gives us 65, right? That's an overall difference of 65. So um, if the temperature were to increase from zero to 10 degrees Celsius, right? We know that the landing, or I'm sorry, the takeoff distance becomes 65 feet longer, right? We just need to figure out how many of these 65 feet that we need to lengthen the distance by, right? Because we know if we have a temperature of seven degrees, it's not going to be as short as that zero degree value, right? So we know there has to be some addition there. We just need to figure out how much, okay? So we're going to set up a ratio or a fraction. If we take that difference and we put it over the difference in temperature, we can figure out what the change is per degree, okay? So 65, again, is that difference between 910 and 845. But if we subtract the 10 degrees, I'm sorry, the 0 degrees from the 10 degrees, we get a difference of 10, right? There are 10 degrees of change between the two. So we would put 10 under here, and we would go ahead and do the division, right? And that should give us 6.5, okay? So 6.5 feet of change per one degree Celsius, okay? So that's what the change is. Now, we've got, again, two ways to go about this. Um, we can either add our adjustment to the lower value. So we can either add something to the 845 to figure out what this middle value is, or we can subtract from the 10 to figure out what it is. And it, it both gets us the same thing. So I will show you both. I didn't show you both in class, but I will show you both in case you want to do it another way. Okay. So let's start with adding to the lower value. If we know that there are 6.5 feet of change, right, for every one degree, then we can figure out how many feet we need to add to the lower value, right? So the first thing to consider is are we adding or subtracting to the, to the lower value? And in this case, we are adding, right? Because as temperature goes up, we know our distance increases, okay? So if it's 6.5 feet per degree increase, right, we know we are increasing by seven degrees from zero, right? Because if we subtract the seven from zero, then that's a difference of seven, okay? So we need to multiply the 6.5 times seven. Okay, so that's five here. Add the decimal and that's 45.5. Okay, so that is how many feet are added to that lower value, right, when the temperature increases from zero degrees to seven degrees. Okay, so if we add the 45.5 to the 845, that gives us a value of 800 and, oops, whoa, what's going on there? 
890.5. Okay. Now, same thing if we did it the other way, right? Um, we know that there are 6.5 feet of change per, per degree, right? But if we go from the higher value at 10 degrees, that 910 feet, down to our 7, then we need to subtract from that higher value, right? So we're not adding, but we're subtracting now, okay? And the number of degrees between 10 and 7 is 3, right? So 10 minus the 7 gives us 3 degrees. So in this case, if we multiply the 6.5 times 3, we get... Yikes, my writing, we get 19.5, okay? So if I, and remember we're subtracting from that higher value, right? So if I subtract 19.5 from the 910, then I again get 890.5, okay? So you can do that whatever way you want, right? Both of those are perfectly fine. Just make sure you're doing the correct thing. I would say pick one over the other, whichever one is easier for you to understand and, and replicate. All right, let's do the same thing for the bottom column. I'm gonna kind of run through the math a little bit here because I've shown you that top one, right? So again, we are taking the difference between these two values. So 1000 minus 925, right, and that's 75. And then we're dividing that by how many degrees difference there are between those two columns. So 10 minus zero is a difference of 10 degrees. So put it over 10 equals 7.5 degrees, or I'm sorry, 7.5 feet of change per one degree, right? So we can handle this the same way. We can multiply that by 7 and add that to the lower value, or we can multiply that by 3 and subtract it from the top value. It's all the same, okay? So just for kicks and giggles, I'll do 7.5 times the 3, and that's 22.5. So I'm going to take my 1,000 and subtract the 22.5 from that. So that gives me 977. Ooh, yikes. 977.5, okay? So if we've got 977.5 there and 890.5, we are one step closer to figuring out what this middle value is. Now, if we are interpolating between the temperatures first like we did, we don't need to fill in this box and we don't need to fill in this box. These boxes are only here. If you want to interpolate between um, the pressure altitudes first, if you do those first, then those boxes that we just got done filling in, um, we wouldn't need. Okay, so now um, we need to interpolate between sea level and 1000 um, pressure altitudes, right, for just one foot of pressure altitude. So we're going to handle this the same way, right? We are going to figure out what the difference is between these two numbers here in the middle columns that we just figured out. And we're going to divide that by the number of feet here, right, between our thousand and sea level, okay? So we know the number of feet between zero and a thousand is a thousand. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that there on the bottom. And this is again showing how many feet of change there are um, per feet, I guess, per feet of pressure altitude, if that makes sense, right? So if I go up a foot in pressure altitude, how many more feet are added to my takeoff distance is the best way of phrasing that. Okay, so if I take my 977.5 and I subtract 890.5 from that, that gives me a difference of 87. Okay, so if I divide that 87 by 1,000, I get 0 0.087. So sorry for my terrible writing. Okay, 0 0.087. 
So what this is saying is that for every foot increase in pressure altitude, my takeoff distance lengthens by 0 0.087 feet, okay? Now, the nice thing about this is one foot of pressure altitude is very close to sea level, right? That is zero, okay? So the easiest thing for us to do in this particular example would be to add to the lower value, right? So we would add to the 890.5, okay? And because it is just one foot um, away, right, from sea level, that's just a difference of one, okay? So one minus zero is one. So we would multiply the 0 0.087 by one and we would get 0 0.087. So we are adding this 0 0.087 to the 890.5 and that gives us, I don't think I can fit all this in here nicely, 890, Ooh, I am so sorry about my bad writing, 0.5, Eight, seven, eight hundred ninety point five eight seven. I'll say it because I'm sure you guys can't read that. I can't read it. It's horrible. Okay, but that is the result for now. Now, are we done? Well, no. Okay, um, no, we are not done because there are notes to take into account, right? Um, Let's say that we plan to do the short field take takeoff technique like they want us to do, right? So we don't really have to worry about those. We're on a paved surface, so we don't have to worry about the runway being grass. And we are at a field elevation far less than 3,000 because it's only 411 for us. The note that we have to concern ourselves with is the one about wind, right? So if we go back here, I'm sorry, I'm so worried that my notes will go away, that I've worked so hard to, to scribble, right? allegedly. Um, but anyway, note number three says decrease distances 10% for each nine knots of headwind. Now we know that we have set ourselves up to have a headwind, right? And from this chart here, we figured out that with this particular wind um, and the distance or the, the, I guess, number of degrees between the runway we're planning on using, which is 1-8 left or 1-8 right, there is a 12 knot headwind component, right? We've already figured that out. So what we can do is we can go back here and we can set that math up as a ratio, right? So if we are decreasing our distances by 10% for every nine knots of headwind. So um, it's up to you. I know in class, I moved this to a decimal but honestly, it's maybe easier to leave it as a percent because that way you don't have to move it back to a percent. Um, so temper we'll set this up as a ratio, right? So decrease your, um, your distances, right? 10% for every nine knots of headwind. So what I'm doing is I am putting the 10% over this really terrible nine, right? So on top is my percentage of decrease. And on, on the bottom is the headwind component, right? Okay, so if I know that that's the relationship that they have called for, then I can um, set up the other side in a similar manner, right? So the thing I do know is that we have a 12-knot headwind component, right? So this can go on the bottom in the same spot. So be careful. When you are setting up these ratios, make sure that they reflect one another. And what I mean by that is if we have the percentage of decrease up here on top, then that's what needs to go on top over here, right? If we have the um, headwind component on the bottom, then that's what needs to go on the bottom over here, okay? If you flip them, your numbers will not be correct. So make sure that it is set up properly. Okay, so the, the thing we don't know, which I will call X, yep, welcome back to algebra, um, is the percentage of decrease that we will have if we do have the 12 knot headwind, okay? So here we can do some cross multiplication, right? So what this would bring me to is 9x equals 120, okay? 
So we get x by itself, divide both sides by 9. So if I do that division here, 120 divided by 9 gives me 13.3 repeating percent. Okay, and again, if you made that a decimal, you would just get um, 0 0.13 point, I'm sorry, 0 0.13333333333, right? Um, so I just decided to keep it as a, as a percent, right? Um, let's see. Yeah, so, okay, so 13% decrease roughly. Um, now, you have a choice here. You can actually do the 13.33% decrease. Now, um, for the math to actually work out, you will have to make this a decimal. Um, or you could round this to the closest whole number. And we have to be careful about that, right? Because this is a percentage of decrease for the wind, right? We don't want to round up because that's saying that we have more wind than we actually do, right? We don't want to round this up to 14% decrease. We want to round this down to 13% decrease, okay, if we're going to do rounding. So um, why don't we do that for the sake of this? So let's say now our decrease is um, by 13%. We have two choices here. We can convert this into a decimal, so plop that decimal place over, or move it over two spots, right? And it's now a decimal and not a percentage any longer. So we can either multiply our total that we figured out, so the 890.587 by 0.13, and then subtract that from our 890.587. Or what we can do, is we can find the complementary decimal or percentage. And what I mean by that is if we were to subtract this 0.13 from 1 or 13% from 100, what would be the percentage or the decimal that we would get that would complete the whole? So um, for this, that would be if we went ahead and we subtracted the 0.13 from 1, that would be 0.87 or 87% is the complementary value, right? And we could just go ahead and multiply our 890.587 by the 0.87, and that would give us our takeoff distance. We wouldn't have to do anything else to it, okay? So if I multiply that by the 0.87, let's see, 890.587, um, that gives me 774.8106. Nine. Okay. So again, I would round this up. Okay. Um, you can leave it as is, or you can round it up. Okay. So I would call this either seven seventy four point eight or seven seventy five. Remember, even if it's closer to the whole number that's below whatever your um, number with the decimal is, I would still round up, right? Because what we were doing is we were preparing ourselves for potentially worse performance, right? We don't ever want to round down to an area of better performance that we likely won't achieve, right? So we're just trying to, again, adopt that better, better safe than sorry attitude. Okay. Okay. So continuing, sorry, I had to take a phone call. Um, continuing, that is our end result. So 775 feet. Okay. Let's move on to the next chart here. Let's look at our, oh, I'm just realizing, I'm looking at the other screens. You guys can't see all, well, there's some things that are maybe slightly cut off. So I'll try to be better about that in the, in the future here. Okay, so let's look at the next type of chart. Let's look at the climb chart. Now, the climb chart, we kind of take with a grain of salt for a few different reasons, right? It is a chart that shows us time, fuel, and distance to climb, again, at the 2450 um, weight. And um, again, we can expect probably slightly better performance if we are less than that 2450. Right. Um, when we're climbing, of course, we're going to have flaps up right after we finish the uh, short field takeoff technique. Uh, 
full throttle, right? And then standard temperature is also the caveat there, right? So we're not going to have that standard temperature always in effect. Um, these days, it's going to be, the actual temperature is going to be greater than the standard temperature. So we'll have to take that into account, okay? There's even a note about it, right? We've got um, a note about adding 1.1 gallons of fuel for engine start, taxi, and takeoff allowance. Um, I never add 1.1, I always add two, just in case I spend a little extra time um, on the ground, right? Um, you might have a 15-minute um, IFR hold time, so that, you know, you don't really plan for that kind of stuff. That happened to me the other day. Um, but yeah, 1.1 gallons for fuel for start, taxi, takeoff. And then um, this also, again, assumes that you lean the mixture above 3,000 for max RPMs. And then um, you need to increase your time, fuel, and distance by 10% for each 10 degrees above standard temperature. And then number four is the main reason why we kind of take this chart with a grain of salt. Um, distances shown are based on zero win. So as I said before, most days we don't have zero win at the surface. And even if we do have zero wind at the surface, we pr pretty much hardly ever have zero winds, zero knot winds aloft. Okay. So there's always going to be some wind that's playing a part, right? And the other thing that kind of throws a wrench into this beautiful chart is the fact that our takeoff direction, so our runway direction, does not always coincide with our um, course heading for our cross country, right? So if we're supposed to go, I don't know, up to St. Louis, right, that's kind of like a northwesterly direction of travel. And if we use the 18, well, now we have to go down to the south, right? We have to climb to 300 uh, below pattern altitude, altitude, or pattern altitude, right? and then make our turn out right to the northwest. So that's going to chew up some, some time, right? And our distance isn't exactly going to be the same, right? Or maybe if they have to maneuver you around, vector you a little bit, that's going to also chew that up, right? Or change that. So we can't always expect these figures to be accurate. Um, we just kind of use them to get kind of a, a general idea, right? Okay, so the way that we use this chart is, again, there's math involved, right? When is there not math involved with um, performance charts? But what we do here is we do a little bit of subtraction. So we subtract whatever our cruise pressure altitude is. Um, I'm sorry, we, we subtract whatever our field elevation pressure altitude is from our cruise pressure altitude, okay? And we do that for the time, the fuel, and the distance, right? So um, if we figured out that based on the information before, we had a pressure altitude of like one foot, right? We could essentially just make this sea level for, for ease, right? So zero feet pressure altitude here under those conditions. So if we are doing this type of math, let's say we are climbing up to... I don't know, 4,500. Let's say that's 4,500. We need to figure out what our actual pressure altitude is going to be at 4,500. So remember the adjustment for pressure altitude that we figured out was 410, which that, that gave us the one foot of pressure altitude for our field elevation. We need to do the same thing to our pressure altitude um, or to find our pressure altitude for crews. So if we do this math here, then that gives us um, about, yikes, yikes, I'm so sorry guys, 4,090 feet, right, for our pressure altitude, okay. So we can essentially call this 4,000 for our pressure altitude for cruise. Okay, so essentially what we're doing here is we're taking the values that are listed for a pressure altitude of 4,000 and the values listed for a pressure altitude of sea level or zero, and we are putting those things together in the um, equation above, right? So if we look at time, 
we've got a um, time of zero right at sea level, but at 4,000 for our pressure altitude, we've got a time of six minutes. So six minus zero gives us six. So theoretically, this climb is going to take us six minutes, okay? If we want a, um, a rough estimate for fuel, then we need to, again, do the same thing, right? Um, we see for 4,000, it's showing a burn of 1.5, and then sea level, zero, right? So 1.5 minus the zero gives us 1.5. Now, we can go ahead and take note number one into account. Um, for this particular example, I will stick to adding the 1.1 gallons um, instead of my usual two. So 1.5 plus 1.1 is 2.6 gallons of projected fuel burn. And then our distance, yikes, our distance, right, we would find the same way. So 4,000 pressure altitude followed across, and then 8, right? So 8 miles, and then 0 for sea level, so 8 minus 0 is 8. So at this particular moment, right, this climb would take us six minutes, we would burn 2.6 gallons, and it would also take us a distance of eight miles to climb, okay? Now, um, again, reading those notes, right? We'll make sure that we've leaned the mixture above 3,000. There will be wind, so we probably won't expect these exact figures, right? If we have more of a headwind on the climb out, um, we will have better performance, right? Shorter climb distance, less fuel burn, um, less time, right? Um, but note number three, right? Increase time, fuel, and distance by 10% for each 10 degrees above standard temperature. So for that, we would need um, to look at kind of the, the, the temperature spread, right? Um, so for instance, we would look at, um, we would look to see what the temps are, right? So if we have a pressure altitude that's putting us pretty much at sea level, right, then um, we would go back to our example here, right? And remember that seven degrees was our temperature. So it's actually less than that. And I don't have winds and temps aloft picked out for this, but I would imagine if that's what's happening at um, sea level, then the value for our standard temp at uh, 4,000 would probably be less than standard, right? So I don't think we have to make that alteration because it's not going to put us 10 degrees above standard okay so at the end of the day these are our rough figures right so six minutes for the climb ish 2.6 gallons of fuel burn and then a distance of eight miles is how we figure that out um now let's say that our pressure altitude puts us um at um, around like 500 feet um, that's where it kind of gets interesting because you can see for some of these columns, the value that we would interpolate and pick out is like nice, right? And others, it's not really. Well, actually for 500, it works pretty decently, right? So for this, uh, for time, it would be, yikes, um, half a minute, right? So 0.5 minutes. And then for fuel burned, right? If we were interpolating between the sea level and the 1,000 for 500, uh, pressure altitude, 500 foot pressure altitude, it would be 0.2, okay, and then distance, it would be 1. So how we would navigate that, let's again say that we're climbing to a pressure altitude of 4,000. Uh, we would do the same math just now with these new figures, right? So I would do the 6 minus the 0.5, so that would, it would theoretically take us 5.5 minutes to do the, do the climb. Um, for fuel, 1.5 minus the 0.2, right? So 1.3 gallons fuel burn plus the 1.1 would be our new figure. And then um, for distance, 8 minus 1 means about 7 miles for that climb. Okay, you can always, again, round um, for worse performance um, if that's, you know, what you feel works better, okay? Um, but that is how you would use that chart, okay? It's not a perfect chart by any means, but it gives us some idea, okay? So generally speaking, when you go on cross countries, you're not going to have everything kind of fall into place um, because of the runway that you might be using for takeoff. 
and then also um, the wind, right? What is the wind doing? Is it helping our client performance? Is it making it worse? Um, it can be a mix of both sometimes, right? If you're taking off and you're having to change direction, you will likely have a nice, strong, great headwind at the beginning. And then when you're turning to another direction, you might now get a tailwind, right? Which is going to push you further, increase that distance, increase that time and fuel burn and all that stuff. Okay. All right. Next chart is going to be the cruise performance chart. Okay. So when we plan across country, we need to obviously figure out our pressure altitude, right? So let's um, let's say that our pressure altitude is going to be um, 5,000, okay? Let's say that is 5,000. So we picked this, right? Um, we need to, again, kind of use the tic-tac-toe method a little bit, um, but a couple disclaimers first, right? Um, the first is make sure you pick a constant RPM setting, right, to interpolate between. So um, you can see here, right, depending on the temperature, some of these RPM settings might not be available, okay? So um, pick something that is available, right, if your temperature is kind of below standard. So you have those interpolation figures. So I am trying to get from point A to point B fairly quickly. So I'm going to choose um, 2250, okay, for my RPM setting. So 2250 for my RPM. Okay, so... If I've got a pressure altitude of 5,000, right, I already know I'm interpolating between um, the pressure altitude values for 4,000 and 6,000, right? So I would follow this line and this line here. Okay, um, so we already know that that's happening. Um, now, the other thing to kind of take into account is that there are a lot of numbers here. Um, the good news is you don't have to worry about absolutely all of them. This is so hard writing while talking, but you don't have to worry about all of them. There are some that are kind of irrelevant for us, right? The brake horsepower percentage, we don't really care about, so we don't have to worry about that, okay? We just need to be concerned about our true airspeed and our gallons per hour, right? We wanna know how fast we're moving through the air and we wanna know how much fuel we are burning every single hour to make sure we bring enough, right? So those are the things that you should be concerned about. Now, the temperature we still have, right? Because we are calculating that density altitude. The difference here though, is we don't have just straight up temperature values, right? Before we had like zero degrees, 10, 20, 30, 40, now we have standard temperature and then um, 20 degrees below standard and 20 degrees above standard, okay? So let's say that, I don't know, I don't have winds, temps, aloft information. Maybe I should also put that in. But let's say that the temperature is, um, I don't know, negative 3 at 4,000. Okay, we need to figure out, is this standard or not? Okay, now the way we do that is we go off of our standard standard um, atmosphere information, right? So we know that we have 15 degrees for standard sea level temperature, and we are supposed to lose two degrees per thousand, right? So if we are interpolating for 5,000, I think I said three degrees at negative three at 4,000, but I meant 5,000 if that's what I said. Um, if we are interpolating for 5,000, right, then we would need to um, figure out how much loss there should be, right? So if it's two degrees per thousand and we are climbing by uh, climbing 5,000, then we should expect a net loss of 10 degrees, right? So it's 10 um, subtracted from the 15 of standard, and that gives us five, 
okay? So five degrees is the standard temp at 5,000, but we have negative three, not five, okay? So we need to use both the standard temperature column and the 20 degrees below standard temp to figure out um, what the performance is going to be like, okay? So for this, I just write ST for standard temp, and in parentheses, I will usually put what it is. So 5 degrees was standard, okay? And then we've got the actual temperature, so the negative 3, I hope I have enough space here, negative 3 degrees, and then we've got the 20 below. Ooh, yikes. Okay. And if we go 20 below, right, then that is negative 15 in this case, right? I just subtracted my 20 from my 5 degrees to get that. Okay. So we will take the values from those columns as we did before, right? Same thing. We just have a few extra numbers this time. So if we go in the 20 degrees below standard temp column, and again, we are re uh, referencing the 2250 RPM settings, right? Because that's what our desired RPMs are. We are matching those between the two. Our um, true airspeed is 115, right? Our gallons per hour is 9.2. So 115 here. And 9. Point two. Sorry, that is absolute rubbish. Okay, um, and then our standard temp column for that same RPM setting, right, and same pressure alt altitude is 114 and 8.6. Okay, do the same thing for 6,000, right? We come across here to our below 20, or 20 below standard, at that same RPM setting. We get 115 um, and 8.7. And then over here, for the standard temperature column for the same RPM setting at 6,000 pressure altitude, we get 114 and 8.1. Okay, again, we have a couple different choices. We can go in off of the pressure altitude, right? We can interpolate that difference first, or we can go off of temperature. Since we did temperature last time, let's go off of the pressure altitude. So this one is really easy because you can see that the true airspeed is the same, right? So if I'm in this negative or 20 below the standard column here, then 115 for both these values, right? So it's it's also going to be 115 for that. And then I'm, I'm going to uh, come back for the for the fuel, but 114 over here for both, so I can just transfer that. Okay. All right. So now, if we take the difference between 9.2 and 8.7. And the difference between 8.6 and 8.5, we can see that the difference for both of those is 0.5, right? If we've got um, this number right in the middle, right, um, for the pressure altitude, right, so 5,000 is equidistant from 4,000 and 6,000, then we would split that difference directly in half, right, or right in half. So 0.5 divided by half is 0.25, okay? So again, we know that it's somewhere between those values, so we can either add that to the lower value or we can um, subtract that from the higher value, right? So if I go 8.7 plus 0.25, that gives me 8.95. If I go 9.2 minus the 0.25, that gives me 8.95 as well, right? Um, I would say for fuel, let's not be that exact on the numbers, let's go ahead and um, round. Now, with fuel burn, we always want to round up, right? We want to um, plan 
for the aircraft to burn more fuel than it might actually burn, so that way we have more reserves, right? Um, so if we have a value of 8.95 um, between the 9.2 and the 8.7, then I will call that just 9. Yikes. I am so sorry about that, guys. Okay, 9 gallons per hour is what I would call that. And then for over here, right, we can do the same thing. Um, again, difference of 0.5, right, for that standard temperature column of 5 degrees. Difference of 0.5 and um, divide that in half, that's 0.25, right? So I would, again, um, add that to the lower value or subtract it from the higher value. So if I go 8.6 minus 0.25, it gives me 8.35. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to round up, right? We always want to round up for more fuel burned than there might actually be burned. Okay, so 8.4 and 9 are my values there. Now, the beautiful thing about uh, accounting for the temperature is that, again, this is pretty simplistic, right? Especially for that true airspeed. We have 114 and 115. So let's just figure out which of these values the negative 3 degrees in the middle is closer to. Is it closer to 5 degrees or is it closer to negative 15 degrees? Well, between negative 15 and negative 3, there's a difference of 12, right? And between negative 3 and 5 degrees, there's a difference of 8. So it is objectively going to be closer to the standard temperature column, right? So I'm going to call my true airspeed here 114. Right, there's no sense in figuring out an exact number for airspeed because um, it's hard enough to maintain 114 rather than 115 as it is. And truth be told, you might actually end up going 115, right? Because it, it's just hard. Okay, um, so we'll call this 114, and then we will maybe do the same thing for the. Well, actually, let's be a little bit more technical with the fuel just to see, right? So. Um, we'll treat it the same as we did before. We'll find the difference between the 9 and the 8.4, which is 0. 0.6, and then the total number of degrees difference between 5 and negative 15, so that's 20. So we'll put that over 20 to find out how much change we have in um, fuel burn per All right, sorry guys about the awkward pause. I had to go help my wife. Um, one of our cats decided to venture outside when she got home. Um, but continuing the thought process here, right? Um, we found the difference between the two values for the standard temp column and the um, 20 below standard temp as 0.6, right? And then we put that over the total difference in temperatures, right? So we're figuring out how much change there is in fuel burn uh, per degree of, of temperature difference, right? So if I, let's see here. Um, and honestly, in a real life scenario, I might just choose the nine gallons, right? That's not that much of a difference. Um, but again, always round up and not down um, for that. But I'll just go ahead and do the math, right? So 0.6 divided by 20 is 0 0.03, right? So that's how much change there is um, per um, per degree, right, of temperature difference. So there are eight degrees of temperature difference between the negative three and the five degrees, right? So the 8.4 is the lower value. I know things have kind of flip-flopped themselves this time, but it is the lower value. So I'm going to add my, um, well, let me, let me back up a step, right? So if I know it's 0 0.03 um, gallons burn of, of change, right, for every degree, I need to multiply that by 8 because that difference is by 8. So that gives me 0.24, okay? And I'm going to add this to the lower value, right? Because I figured out the distance between, or the difference between the negative 3 degrees and the 5 degrees, um, and it's the lower value there, okay? So I'm adding the 0 0.24 to the 8.4. And that gives me 8.64. Um, we're going to go ahead and just call this, like I said, I might call this eight, uh, 9, but let's call this 8.7, right? Always round up. Okay, so we are not done just yet, 
the other thing we have to do is take those notes into account, right? So the note only affects our true airspeed. And what it says is cruise speeds are shown for an airplane equipped with speed fairings. Without speed fairings, decrease speeds shown by tune-up. Now, what are speed fairings? They are essentially wheel pants. They are this aerodynamic covering that you can install over the tire brake assembly that, um, you know, provides less drag, right? So you can have slightly faster cruise speeds. Um, we don't have any of that. So this true airspeed here now becomes 112, okay? So for this particular set of conditions, we are going to cruise through the air at a true airspeed of 112, and we are estimating a burn of fuel um, of 8.7 gallons of fuel per hour. Okay. So those are the end results there. And we would, again, apply that to our planning, right? We would use the true airspeed to figure out how long it's going to take us to get to destination. We would use that fuel burn then to figure out how much fuel we are burning in that time it takes for us to get there. Okay. All right, and then the last thing is the landing distance chart. Um, if you look at that, you can see that it is pretty much exactly like the takeoff distance chart. The only real difference is the fact that um, the values are different, right? They're a little bit shorter because all we're doing is coming to a stop, right? We're not trying to accelerate ourselves to a point where we can leave the runway. And again, you've got the conditions, you've got notes, right? They're pretty much the same thing for our purposes. Um, decreased distance is 10% for each nine knots headwind. So we know how to do that, right? And then I guess note four is a little different. If you're landing with flaps up, then you need to increase uh, the approach speed by seven knots and then allow for 35% longer distances. So that's quite a penalty to pay if you do a no flap landing. Okay, so I don't think I need to do a, a, um, an example for this. We would just handle it the same way we did the takeoff distances. Okay, um, if you have any questions at any time, please let me know. And um, this is actually kind of exciting to be getting back to, to making these for you guys. Um, I hope that they are helpful and that you can read my chicken scratch. Um, okay, I will see you guys on Monday.